Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome to Mind Heist, episode 67. How's it going, Muhammad? I'm so tired, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, oh. you know, I was thinking, bro, in terms of like, you know, having two kids, three kids, you know, being young, being all, all being young, you know, at the same time. I mean, imagine having like two or three toddler age kids at the same time. It's quite mad. But, um, what I what I kind of concluded is that it's not normal for like one woman to be raising like two three kids like at the same time on her own in it. I don't think. Yeah. I don't think this is maybe a new phenomenon that it's like one woman has to uh, deal with that, or I don't like using the word deal with, but you know what I mean. Like she has to be take care of the, that you know two three kids like at the same time when they're all young, like you know. So yeah, we need to fix it's difficult, this, bro. It's difficult, bro. Really difficult. But yeah, Alhamdulillah. I mean, I don't, I don't know what's happened to me the past few days. I think it's because I finished. Obviously, I'm doing night shifts occasionally now. Well, at the end of every week, I'm I finish off on night shifts. Do mm. you know what I mean? Mm. And then I've just a few, like a few weeks ago, I've been all right, but this week for some reason, I just. I haven't been able to get back into my sleeping routine mm. to the point where most of yesterday I spent going in and out of sleep, like falling asleep on the sofa. And then I still slept throughout the whole night. Cause usually what happens is if you sleep a bit during the day, you struggle sleeping at night. But like, bro, I was just 24 seven knocked out, bro. <laughs> and I'm still so tired now. But Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Um, yeah, you know, I mentioned last week uh, this article I was reading on the collapse of the extended family and how, like, the nuclear family became the norm and now even the nuclear family is getting fragmented and stuff. And oh, yeah. the article kind of ended talking about the new definition of uh, family that people are creating. And obviously the article's focusing on the West, yeah? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. America specifically. And it's like now people are forming communities slash extended families, not based on blood, but just based on deciding to live together. And they even have like specific projects or developments where it's like, for example, 10 homes all built together and all built in a way where it's like designed for these 10 families to be very quite like close to each other. And like part of the rules of if you want to rent there is like you have to be willing to, you know, babysit other other kids and you have to be willing to do this and this. So people are now in a more artificial way creating communities, you know, or like micro or mini communities. So it's always the case, like people go extreme and then they come back the other direction, you know. Yeah, I suppose they see the benefit of that, which was lost. Um, yeah, I, I definitely. That's what we've got Definitely. nowadays, I mean. Yeah, a, and and I would love to create something like that. And I, I, I'm kind of trying to, to be honest, but we'll see in the next, like, 12 months where I how, you know, where I get with that. But um, it'll be interesting, man, because I do think, you know, like a friend, uh, I was talking to a friend who is, like, in a country where, the f like, a lot of flights to a lot of countries are now not allowed. Like, they're all yeah, of course. banned, right, shut off. So... It's like you end up, you can very much like within just a few short days, short weeks, you end up stranded. Yeah. Um, you can't even, you don't have access to a sheikh to ask for fatawa. You don't have, um, you know, family around you. You don't have this, you don't have that. So you kind of need to try and live in a permanent state of being around the type of people that you would like to be around permanently. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, but obviously, some sometimes that's easier, sometimes that's harder, you know. But yeah, I suppose for yourself, you're quite transient anyway. Like, it seems like you're you're quite open to the idea of moving around and, and yeah, stuff. yeah. Like, you're quite yeah, I always say person. that's my, I always say that's my benefit that I'm not, like, I find it, I I understand if someone was let's say live, live, born and raised in the UK and now they're thinking of moving to to any particular country they would find that very intimidating and very much a big deal. Whereas for yeah. me, I understand that it's much easier for me. Like 
I've even though I have lived in places for very long periods of time, I still was never um, attached to that place. And so, yeah, like I think it's relatively easy. It's still quite intimidating, but it's relatively easy for me to just kind of pick up and leave. It's like it's a think- casual thing that I'll mention to my wife, like, oh, yeah, maybe we'll move there, you know. <laughs> Do you think that would change when your son's a bit older? Well, I'm planning to make it change. So, like, I'm planning to find a place where I will actually call home, I will actually commit to, I will actually invest in, and therefore yeah. moving elsewhere will become intimidating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I suppose, like, it, it might be hard for yourself to adapt because it might be easier said than done. Like, when you eventually do, you know, settle somewhere and say, okay, I'm going to establish this as my, my yeah. home. Yeah. And, um, you know, with with time, you might be like your urge to move again might kick in, and it might yeah. develop like a conflict for yourself. Yeah, it could do. It could do. I don't see that happening, but you never know. It's true because I'm so used to being, you know, free if you like, you know. Yeah. But ultimately, bro, it's like you've got to the benefits of community, having good families around you is so big that you know I can't yeah. justify just going and living somewhere that suits me or even suits me and my wife like the kids the way they grow up the people they grow up around is going to be so it's life-changing like the first 10 to 12 years of your life is pretty much gonna dictate a huge amount of who you become so um, at least at least for that period you gotta be like in a in the best place you can find you know definitely definitely i suppose um calling calling anywhere home is difficult though like truly because you'd always feel like an outsider wherever you go these days yeah this is the isn't it that like a paradox and it? it was like ironic that uh globalization allowed us to move around so much more and so much easier like so the connection has increased but then the disconnection has increased at the same time yeah exactly because everyone's got interests that aren't actually Everyone's got interests and and and, and uh, orientated by things that are not necessarily homegrown interests, mm. like grown in, in certain communities. So, for example, you know, like we said before about the dean, for example, you practice the dean in a way that actually isn't necessarily found, really established anywhere on a, mm. in this day and age. Like, at least for myself, I feel like I learned the dean without any cultural influence like when mm. i started practicing i learned it straight from sources straight from the books um mm. not from any particular way or culture mm. um yeah so wherever you go culturally i'm missing out that cultural element of how the dean is sort of yeah. celebrated or practiced or whatever yeah so it can even mm. be things like aid and things like you know it's things that actually it's it's fine for different people to celebrate them in in in, in varied ways you know yeah. as long as it's celebrated so to speak and that's one thing that people misunderstand like mm. yeah things like aids for example are a good example because they they can be celebrated in many different ways as long as they're celebrated but if you mm. haven't got that cultural association with how certain culture celebrates it you're kind of just like oh what, what do i do mm. so you it start doing it in a weird mm. yeah, you start doing it in a weird western way that actually doesn't really exist anywhere mm. um well the whole yeah, that's Low a new way. You know, one thing though, have you ever met like uh, religious uh, Tunisians or Moroccans, like, and got to know uh, them pretty well? And... No, maybe, hmm. maybe. See, I've met when I was in Tunisia during 2011. That was when I really started seeing practicing Tunisians, and I right. realized that actually a lot of Tunisian youth hmm. wanted to be practicing. They really mm-hmm. did that's when it kind of flourished um Mm. because i was blown away back then because i was like oh my god this is crazy like i felt at home i was surrounded Mm. by people that would you know with thobes and beards and and, and, you know real you know classic practicing imagery Mm. Um, because i think even for them they had to start taking the dean from its sources as opposed to from the culture because the culture didn't have any dean in it for such a long time Mm. do you know what i mean so people were taught like people's discussions would be about fiqh and would be about dean and would be about the rulings and stuff like this because they were also all learning yeah and had the ability to openly learn and practice um but that quickly kind of shut down now and that doesn't really exist anymore as openly as it did back then so i saw a glimpse of it but I haven't mm. seen anything since. And yeah, as far I as think, like Western, yeah. Western like 
you know, Tunisians or Moroccans in the West. I haven't really seen many. Maybe more so Moroccans I've seen, but definitely mm. not any Tunisians, bro. You might find that those are the people that you really do find yourself to be very similar to. Um, mm. Because, for example, if I think of my father-in-law, it, he's not like, he's not Western. He doesn't know, I'm pretty sure he doesn't know any of the Western, like Duat, Shur, none of that, yeah? yeah? But me and him, I would say, are very much similar in terms of our, you know, general culture or general approach to Islam. Yeah. So it's like, it's uh, it, it's all grounded in 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 the very much in the whatever you want to call it the the texts if you like, but then it's it's also naturally like that coming from the Algerian culture, you know, coming from yeah, the Arab culture, whatever you call it. So I think if you knew those people, you would say those are my people. Like, yeah, definitely. Pretty much any religious Arabs you might find, yeah, that's pretty much how I am kind of thing. Well, yeah, I mean, I want to, I want to get mm. more involved in that culture, and I want to be more aligned to, to especially North African culture and North African sort of understandings. But it's difficult to navigate when you don't know what you can get away with, kind of thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially over there, bro. Like, you know, like my dad's just come back from Tunisia yesterday. Ah, and I picked that. him up from the airport and you know he talks briefly about what the situation is over there and stuff and I think he, he worries about me being over there because I'm so loud and proud about my dean I'm not mm. even loud and proud like I'm not you know it's not like I'm giving down in the streets or making mm. YouTube videos or whatever like I'm just yeah. visibly just relatively loud yeah. yeah just relatively like if someone asks me I'll answer the question but I'm not going to stop throwing it in their face yeah. and I suppose my beard is probably the biggest thing that mm. kind of you know and it's true, like, you know, over there there's issues, bro. Like, I was watching a, this brother on Instagram, bro, and he's just a tourist. He's like, mm. he's called the Muslim tourist. I'll give him a shout out because I don't even know he knows me at all. But mm. he did a, he went to Tunisia recently. And bro, like him and his friends, like, they just look like typical sort of, you know, Arab teenagers and that. Like, yeah, they pray and stuff, but they're not necessarily... You know, you wouldn't scream, "Oh, they're they're like sheikhs or something, bro." Mm. Like, you know, and and you know, no disrespect to any of them, but their beards aren't that big or anything like that. Do you know what I mean? It's not like um. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so he got stopped at the the Tunisian airport and for ages, bro, like hours and hours and hours. And then when he came out, he did a little story. And apparently, at one point, he was asked, he was asked, "Does he pray?" Like they mm. are the security asked him, or the police, or whoever asked him if he prays and stuff, bro. That's like insane like an insane question to ask someone yeah. in another country like in any other in any other muslim country to be asked that is just a bit silly mm. do you know what i mean because what does it what does it mean what does it even matter whether you pray yeah. or not do you mm. know what i mean yeah yeah but obviously there they're trying to gauge it and and like there's also it's difficult to balance whether these are the fears of an old man talking and I'm not trying to disrespect my dad but like he might have a different world view and it's influenced by different media and stuff kind of like a conservative sort of outlook over here in the UK mm. or a right wing mm -hmm. outlook over here like we don't know what kind of influences he's got over there what mm. kind of papers he reads and he gave me a paper actually that I forgot to mention he when he obviously he, he was came in the plane so he had a lot of newspapers with him he goes, oh, here's some Arabic newspapers in case you just want to read them. And mm. I've never really read them, you know what I mean? I've never read mm. uh, Tunisian papers or anything. So I did yeah. read one. Yeah. I, I thought I'd read a bit. And the headline was like, oh, I can't remember how it was in Arabic, but it was like, uh, al min sujoon or something like that. Or something like that. It was literally like a rhyme. And it was like, mm. oh, essentially saying like, oh, the biggest threat we have are all these terrorists that are coming out of prisons now and they're mm. the most likely to blow themselves up and, and create issues mm. and stuff so like straight away in like headline media they've got nothing to talk about so they're talking about what could happen as opposed to mm. something that has happened do you know what right. I mean and it's just right. this fear mongering so the media there bro must be like really on it as, as far mm -hmm. as promoting this sort of anti and, and it even came accompanied with um, you know those like caricatures they do yeah yeah of, of, of like you know comic strips it came yeah. with one that had like a, a big sort of military tunisian military boot kicking mm. this bearded sort of decrepit old man into like hellfire <laughs> and it and it had honestly bro and it had like on the boot it had like tunisian army and then on the 
on the old man it had an arrow saying in herbi like terrorist basically and then this mm. big hole with fire coming out of it said jahim mm. so wow. like this is this is the kind of rhetoric that's getting thrown around you just don't know what mm. you're dealing with you know yeah it's hard to it's imagine mad. that really in a in a in an actual like arab muslim country yeah, it's kind yeah, of mad yeah, yeah. I, maybe it's yeah. i don't know if this is a correct comparison but maybe it's like turkey before the current kind of government maybe yeah, that's yeah, what turkey was like but even so bro and i, I allahu alam yeah but even so if you were to be in turkey bro hmm. you'd still get if you practice your deen in a particular way yeah like the sunnah bro is still uh offensive to a lot of people Mm. Like I, I went to Turkey, bro, not too long ago, and I was stopped and harassed and all sorts, bro. Oh, um, really? Yeah, by bro, the government, was, right? Or? Well, by the police and stuff. Oh, yeah, really. Um, yeah. yeah, bro, it was so like it just it was really crazy, bro. Because mm. it was like twice. Um, they were like taking photos of my phone, taking photos of my WhatsApp, sending their taking photos of our passports and sending them over WhatsApp. Like, really? I could see the guy, bro. Like I could see the plain clothes officer and that. And then when I got out, there's like flipping two or three armed police came up to me, stopped me, mm. and asked me where I was going. I was like, I just came out of security. Like, mm. do you get me? And yeah. Anyway, just check. If I didn't have a return ticket, I think it would have been a real problem. Like I had to prove mm. where I was going, where I was staying, and I'm pretty sure they called ahead to the ho- to the hotel to to see if I was going to turn up, sort of thing. Um, really, but. Once again, and I'm, you know, I know it's really easy to, to start talking smack on all of these sort of policies and procedures that they have, but at the mm. same time, bro, like, I kind of don't blame them, in a lot of ways, because how mm. else would you deal with the problem? Like, yeah, mm. we can't lie that, you know, terrorism and and extremism and stuff is a real problem, and there's a lot of people I speak to that don't believe it exists. They think it's all manufactured, and they think like. You know, like the like terrorist attacks and these people with extreme ideologies and like people that that support and follow whether it's ISIS or Al Qaeda, whatever you want to call them. People, there's people that I speak to on a daily, bro, Muslims that think that it doesn't exist. Like it's all manufactured and it's all sort of done by mm. the government and Western powers, and they all do it to, bro. These people exist, bro. Like fully, bro. I've spoken yeah. to them. Like I've seen them. Like they're real. They're people. There's real people with these mm. ideologies, bro. There's real people that carry out these attacks real people yeah. that have completely confused and misguided and it's the, the reality is yeah they do cause problems mm. for the rest of us yeah um, i mean actually so how, those two uh, countries like tunisia and turkey they both have an issue with that because like yeah, ten thousand tunisians bro. went to isis oh, and then issue bro yeah so, and then turkey is like, like on the border with with syria so exactly like if you go mm. onto the government website the uk government website and look at um because i did this recently looking at like uh, travel advice mm. from Muslim countries because so I was looking at Tunisia I was like oh yeah I've never actually looked at this let me have a look bro, yeah. every single border that Tunisia has is in the red zone because that's where every all these sort of groups are kind of based so these groups like the biggest threat areas are like the Libyan border the Algerian border because not because of anything to do with Algeria but because the borders between Tunisia and Algeria are very mountainous and apparently that's where they're all hiding and that's yeah, where a true. lot of army and, and police and stuff get killed mm. in these sort of areas mm. um, and at the end of the day man it, like if you're a Muslim because all, all let's be real like 99% of Tunisians consider themselves Muslim right that's just the reality yeah. bro but they also they, they they don't know what Islam is in terms of Sunnah and the core yeah they, yeah they might exactly. know bits of it but they're not gonna they follow it to the core 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 so yeah. when they see something so so vividly different especially when that thing is extreme and and misguided they're going to associate that with with you know with a, a foreign understanding of the deen they've got nothing to do with it and then yeah. and then they'll be like why can't you f- practice islam like we practice islam yeah you know, we exactly. still pray we still have the other and we still do ramadan we still give charity we still go to hajj and and you know sometimes i think as 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 hard as it sounds sometimes i think you know what they got a point like i can't argue with that because how do you shape an entire population's understanding without actually integrating into that society because right now you get so pushed away from it no doubt that you can't do you know what i mean you, how do you yeah. change perspective without actually being involved and engaged in the society when actually you can't even get your foot through the door mm-hmm. of that society if mm-hmm. you're being so 
gung ho mm. about certain matters. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no doubt societies need to change, and no doubt the way to do that is through what you might call dawa, right? Which is yeah. in getting involved with the people. Uh, whether it's very subtly or it could be holding some basic classes on how to pray or the importance of prayer or whatever, Ooh. right? That is the that is the foundation of how you change the society to be more accepting of the the things that Ooh. maybe more committed Muslims would consider to be lacking and very important to implement, right? Like, you know, like even like growing the beard, like the average Tunisian or Algerian, maybe they wouldn't really understand like, why are you guys like so passionate about growing the beard? Like, come on. Yeah? yeah. So you don't, but, but that's very understandable from their point of view, because I'll give a real example. So we like, if I was to ask you, like, why do you have a beard? What would you say? So because of, because I've, because I've seen the rule and I've read the, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yeah, and exactly. Now and you know that, that knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? To have that knowledge now and then go, go against it. Is is really difficult thing to do, and it's yeah, it's almost arrogant yeah. to do so. Yeah, so you've got like the you know I mean? you've got the information, and you've categorized it in your head. So it's like, exactly. okay, I've read the hadith. I know that anything the Prophet Sallam says, do not do, like as a command. I know that is now haram, exactly. and I know the scholar yeah. says haram to shave. And therefore, if I shave now, I know that's sinful, and I know yeah. that a Muslim can enter into uh, Jahannam for a certain time. So you know all this stuff, but these guys don't know that, right? But to yeah. get them to the point where they get those nuances and that get that information. You need to come up to them with the soft stuff and the the initial basic things, isn't it? Just yeah. the concept of how fiqh works, for example. You know, these Bro, things. So further back, like, you need to do this dawah. Yeah. Further back to say what, what like the integrity of a hadith. That's the first conversation. Because... Yeah, Bro, for like, some I've people, yeah. People there that haven't got a clue what hadith are and don't believe in it. I remember having an argument mm. with somebody there um, because he, he was convinced that a hadith was a were stories that were made up by by Jews to mess up <laughs> I was going to guess Jews bro <laughs> bro I swear to Typical. god I'm not even joking and yeah. unfortunately you know a lot of people in that circle were saying the same thing and I didn't even know yeah. how to argue against it because like how do you argue against something like that when you don't even do you know what I mean the only way I'm mm. going to argue against something like that is if I have an in-depth knowledge of of ahadith and how they were yeah uh, you know, but not just uh, that, bro. Not uh, yeah, like uh, uh, the chain of narrated and passed on and, and all of that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I can't, but bro, but not I only can't. even if you had that knowledge, bro. You could even if you brought all the knowledge to them in a let's say in a twenty minute session, you're you're just bashing at them and you put, yeah. proved all your points. It still that's not how people change. People change with little droplets, you know, here and there. And so therefore, you need the relationship with the people. But what I was going to say, bro, is you need dawah from the foundation level, but then uh, sometimes the problem is, bro, is that the dawah is actually not allowed in that society. Yeah. Yeah. And that is where, at that point, that's where I say, what do we do at that point? Because now it's like, okay, I understand we just need grassroots change and we need to change societies bit by bit, be patient. I fully believe in that. But then when the actual basic dawah is not allowed, then I'm just like, okay, what do we do from here? You know, well, I'll uh, be honest, I don't man, have I an think... answer. I think it's ultimately it's the lack of patience that is ruined most of us, if not all mm. of us, bro. And and this is one thing like my dad said straight away when he came. Um, mm. He was talking about wait, my son is just literally jumping. Off. Okay, wait a second. <laughs> Can we okay. get out of the room, please? Thank you. Hello. I'll see you in a little bit. All right. Um, essentially, he was saying like a couple of days ago there was an attack or something, blah blah blah, and I was like, it's hard for me to talk to him about this sort of stuff because I know he knows I'm not like that, obviously, but he mm. also worries that I'll get grouped in with those kind of people if I'm over there. Yeah. Um, but he was just like, what was wrong with these people? Like, why do they expect things to change straight away? Like, my dad isn't, you know, he might not be that close visibly to the dean. But he also understands that the dean is the correct way, but mm. knows that right now isn't the time to, to, or the way they're trying to implement it isn't the way to do it. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. it's like, 
what was wrong with these people? Like, what do they think they're going to achieve by blowing up the U.S. embassy or something like that? Because that's what yeah. they're trying to do. I think. I think that something like that was an attack on the U.S. embassy or something along those lines. It's like, well, what have you achieved? Like, what kind of what mm. possible good has come out of that action that you've done? When actually, what yeah, the yeah. the core issue is that you want some rapid change right now. If you you know you want to change yesterday as opposed to a hundred years from now, you just don't want to put the long graft in. The long graft is mm-hmm. just bit by bit, you know, treating your. And I know it sounds really like people say it's really watered down, and you're watering down the religion, etc. It's not. What it is is achieving something in the in a hundred years, as opposed to trying to achieve something tomorrow. Because the damage that you're going to cause by rushing is going to, yeah, to to, to severely damage the reputation of Islam um, in the long yeah. run. And then you go back a few years by by damaging that kind of look of course with yeah. with you know the the reputation that islam has bro like i remember bro i'll be honest like 2011 bro was amazing 2011 tunisia was incredible just the pocket of islam that i saw there and what happened is uh what but the thing is you could see it cropping up you could see this issue of extremism cropping up combined with you know what was happening in syria and the rest of the world but what would, ha- what would happen is i'd be with good practicing brothers and then they would point out someone in their jama'ah or point out someone in the masjid and be like, oh, but be careful about that guy because he's a bit, you know, he's a bit extreme and he follows this and this. So, you know, watch out. Don't really walk around with him. So you could already see there was people that didn't know what to do with all this freedom. Yeah. And there was people yeah. that kind of got drunk on the freedom and thought, oh, this is it. This is a revolution for us. We're going to, um, we're going to, you know, change the world and bring Sharia in and all this other stuff. When actually yeah. they should just chill, like count your blessings mm. right now chill mm-hmm. and use this opportunity to do good not to 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 you know get a bit indoctrinated on the 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 freedom of it all and that's what ended up happening bro what happened was clashes people mm. thought they wanted to carry on this momentum of of quote unquote freedom not mm. really putting into consideration that most of the country isn't upon this yeah you know? yeah yeah most yeah. of the country is just happy to not have a dictator on their heads yeah um and what happened is obviously people then started using violence to try and implement Shelly out, implement bits and bobs, um, till the point where then the general public wanted a, di- a dictator to stamp this out. And those who wanted to be in power and wanted a more hard lined approach would use, you know, yeah. this, this rhetoric of terrorism to then impose mm. themselves upon yeah. the people. Which and justify what... why they need to take away freedom. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. exactly. Yeah, yeah. This is the typical playbook, man. But yeah. uh, inshallah, khair, bro. Inshallah, we can learn from the history, from history, because history is a very good teacher, man. And there are very good examples of what we're talking about now. There are so many examples that we didn't necessarily need to make the same mistakes again, but yet we have done. Oh, uh, course, and inshallah, khair, bro. Let's go to the... What questions bro oh yeah sorry yeah <laughs> Yo, are you gonna say the last thing i was just gonna say i think that's why like you've just mentioned it's so important to teach our kids history because it's the kids that are the most hasty and they're the most impatient when it comes no to doubt. change and i remember feeling like that myself bro. i remember being you know when i first started practicing i wanted to give the whole world islam mm-hmm. and you know what i mean you just want people to to share this beautiful religion with you um almost by any means necessary do you know what yeah, i mean yeah yeah um and it's a really difficult place to be in, especially if you haven't got people, you know, elders that are kind of trying to chill you out and calm mm. you down. They'd be like, mm-hmm. listen, it takes time. It's not something that can happen. Yeah. And if you can give them examples such as this and, and show them and, and teach them, then it like, keeps them yeah. you know, at a certain level. There's nothing wrong with the youth leading things, but they always need to be uh, in, co- in conversation and under the guidance of elders. Definitely, um, like... Like there are many young Sahaba and many young figures in Islamic history who did great things, but you will find, I think, that they always had guidance from elders. They weren't disconnected from elders completely. Yeah, definitely. Right. Bro, Um, you know, I I, I think that last question, the question we answered in the last episode, I feel like we, we went quick over it to give a good quick answer, but there are a few points I wanted to pick up on it. So if we could just go over that is quickly that the again. With, um, talking about the, yeah, the, the brother who is yeah. his wife. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, yeah. yeah, sure. So let's just, uh, I just have you got the question up or should I just quickly like paraphrase? Yeah, please recap? quickly paraphrase. So it, yeah. the recap, paraphrasing as far as I can remember, is that this brother is, he's married, 
uh, he's been married to a revert sister and you know things have been fine but as the marriage has sort of developed and as time has gone by and you know he's got i think he's got kids hasn't he at least one yeah child, yeah um his wife has sort of he feels like his wife is sort of i don't know backpedaling a little bit on certain things and maybe taking a more liberal approach and maybe possibly even more like a feminist type approach in terms of she's trying to further her career she wants to go abroad to further her career mm. she wants to uh, work more despite the ability to work less mm. and maybe it's breaking down some of the roles a little bit basically some of the things that we've spoken about and the benefits that we've spoken about in terms of yeah. uh, gender roles and stuff yeah. uh, being a bit backped back when in challenge yeah, and this is yeah. something that probably a lot of people go through yeah uh, yeah so uh, one thing I wanted to pick up on is he said that I remember him saying that his wife was saying that she's kind of just being like Khadija in the sense where she's like going out there and, and making money and stuff and uh, trading or whatever you want to call it because I think he mentioned she's in marketing and sales or something um this is like a big like misconception, right, about what Khadija used to do and what Khadija made her priority and all of that. Um, just the main thing I just wanted to say is, is like Khadija was not going to an office working nine to five as, you know, VP of sales for, yeah. you know, Fortune 500 company. Uh, Khadija, it's more like imagine even today, it's very easy to imagine the scenario of a woman who uh inherits money she let's say a, a woman in the uk muslim woman in the uk let's make it very specific um she inherits you know fifty thousand pounds okay a lot of money if you invest fifty thousand pounds well then you can like make like a good part-time or full-time income from it so she's she's got this fifty thousand pounds and then you know like wahid invest yeah she takes that fifty thousand pounds, and let's say she puts it in Wahid Invest, or let's say she gives it to some of these brokers who would buy different stocks and shares for her, or maybe yeah. certain people who would, um, you know, like there are like these companies who VCs who invest in uh, startups, for example. So let's say she took her fifty thousand pounds, she put twenty five thousand pounds with Wahid Invest, and then she put another twenty five thousand pounds with another company who would uh, pick uh, certain startups to invest in. And that's and then they would pay her the the profits like from the profits, and that's it. Like it it doesn't entail like that's picture I just painted. It doesn't entail leaving the house even. <laughs> yeah, I mean, especially true. these days. So you would imagine Khadija would leave the house, or the Allahu Anha. She would leave the house in order to uh, um, you know pass over the money side of things, but all the goods and all the selling. Uh, it was that's what she hired the Prophet to do for her, isn't it? Yeah, so exactly. it's like, here's the capital. Now go to Syria, buy uh, the goods. Maybe she would even de let him decide which goods are the right goods to buy. And then mm. he would bring it back and sell it and all that. And she would get the profit. So she was like the the capital. You often have this r r arrangement, right? Where you have the person who has the capital and the person who's putting in the work and the time. And you match these two together, and that's how you have a business, right? You have, you have an investor, and you have the founder. That's typical. Mm. It's very easy to imagine today. So, um, unfortunately, I guess this narrative that Khadija was a businesswoman is obviously being misused. It's like that typical uh, kalima to haqin aradu bihi batil. You know, I mean, like a it's, correct. It's, I'll be honest. It's yeah. The the thing is. It's not because people aren't starting businesses because Khadija had one. It's they well, yeah, that, that's true. To, that's to another justify point. Their own desire, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the way yeah. you know people yeah. fail to look at things. Yeah. Like, we and it's not necessarily, not necessarily bad to like start oh, a business or uh, or have a job. Like these things are not inherently haram or whatever, isn't it? Yeah. But it's like, why are you trying to? do something and then look for a false that's the thing it's a false um comparison or analogy to make exactly and it's just you know it's, it's to bolster whatever you wanted to do in the first place yeah um, yeah because if that didn't <clears throat> exist if that whole narrative of Khadija Radiallahu didn't exist mm. then you'd still do it and you try to find something else to do it yeah 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 you know the second thing and so like i would i would be closer to calling Khadija an investor rather than a businesswoman i think they're they're very different things i mean uh, the big the big time investors that i know 
they do not work like they just let their money work for them and they chill yeah. like if they're like successful enough they kind of just chill so uh, that would be a closer analogy maybe but that's one thing the other thing is like i just feel it feels like sad the fact that you know like in certain societies working working for working for somebody and like like propping up their business you know pushing their business forward growing their business um in exchange for a salary is more you know respected you get more kind of clout or whatever for that yeah. versus like raising your kids and let's be real like people follow these things including men like everyone follows like whatever will get you that kind of prestige people tend to follow it and i just wish we could create a society where the attractive fashionable things are things that are good for your akhirah good for people's t- iman good for society but yeah what is popular now is the opposite uh, like I, I don't know man i don't think you can doubt that if if you have a full-time parent the kids are better off than a non-full-time parent and the ummah is better off when you have uh full-time parents like yeah so uh this this uh sister she's obviously attracted to that because of how society is set up and including like if we look at men as well like uh, among some some circles it's cool to like work 11 hours a day 12 hours a day etc yeah. these kind of shifts like that's cool and so a man might do that and then neglect his family so i just wish we could have norms in a society at least among muslims because we have such clear guidance on this uh, where it's like the cool thing it's like yeah take care of your kids prioritize your kids i'm i'm helping my child to memorize quran i'm i'm taking my you know son out to play in the park like these are good things uh, mm. you know inshallah it's there's always a chance to make these things normal um, um e- like every generation we have the chance to do that i feel to make these i would call these smaller changes like to make it a norm to like let's say me and you and like five six seven other families that we know like let's say we're all friends amongst us we can make that cool to do these kind of things so i think these changes are possible you know in our in one generation yeah definitely it's just difficult because we i don't know if we like bubble ourselves a lot and it, it kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier mm. um like the muslim condition is the, the what the what the large majority of Muslims are doing these days and I don't know if the large majority of Muslims think the way we do or have mm. these thoughts or mm. think about the sunnah or think about the deen or where it's going to be in a hundred years or yeah. do you know what I mean yeah. I don't know if thou, these days the large majority of Muslims are just what we would call the majority of most Muslim countries mm. which are just people that are trying to essentially establish whether it's a democracy or whether it's a certain uh, standard of living that maybe the rest of the rest of the west has or do you know what i mean i don't know if my mind is warped in thinking that mm. but but does it matter just... bro because like me and you we're talking on the podcast about ideals and what we're kind of trying to do and all of that mm. and we truly believe these things are good for us and yeah of course we, because we believe it's good for us we believe it's good for everyone and like regardless of if we're like those 0.1 percent we still think it's the best thing and we're still going to try to do it, isn't it i just feel like i'm alienating oh i'm not put, i'm basically not putting in i'm not considering the rest of the because i'm not saying that they're not muslims but i want yeah. to involve them in it but yeah. then at the same time i'm thinking do they even think like this like is this even yeah. part of their thought process and yeah. i feel like it's a shame that i don't want to have this conversation I don't want to keep having these conversations with other Muslims that are sort of on the same wavelength. Yeah, you don't want to preach to like, the choir. We're saying that they don't the have crime. the right to even get involved in this discussion when actually I'd want to bring them in because I yeah. consider them Muslims. And I, want I agree, be, bro, yeah. You know, and I have, it's, it's kind of I have this conflict where it's like I acknowledge that my circle is all a certain type of Muslim and mm. I feel like this type of Muslim needs a little less help. Um, yeah. And therefore, I I'm just feel so conflicted because I don't, I just don't connect to those other people. Or I don't find myself with those people. So, like, what do I do? I don't know. It's hard, isn't it? Because, yeah. you know, I don't know if this is just, a, I mean, ultimately, I, I, a lot of the time I just say it's a sign of the times that we live in. 
um, it's you know you think about these ahadith and you think about these these sort of uh, prophecies of the future and what Muslims are going to be like and, and stuff like that and mm. and you wonder whether you know was that talking about the ones that are practicing that are, cons- that are conscious of their deen or was that talking about the the rest who are you know when 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 we say oh the Muslims are going to be like this one day and the Muslims are going to be like that one day are we including are we thinking about the vast majority that are actually mm. just willy nilly living their lives and haven't really had two th- thoughts about but at the same time and it goes back to what I said earlier maybe a lot of them do have it in them they just mm. don't know how to express <coughs> it or chase it because the 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 foundations and the structures for that aren't mm. really present and they've mm. been kind of put away and yeah. you know what I mean yeah yeah well, yeah well, yeah I'm not sure okay um, bro I've got an email go for it I don't think it's a question but I'll just read it out so and and just before we start yeah my my baby son is sleeping next to me so if he wakes up that's going to be an alarm and <laughs> I think I'm expecting a parcel so if that door knocks I'm going to I'm going to run for it but continue <laughs> okay cool uh so uh we got an email from Hamid assalamu alaikum brothers Amin and Muhammad I'm Hamid from Singapore I hope all is well with you guys and your families fantastic episode as always and I hope Allah rewards you both for the good work and allows you guys to continue the good work he's talking about episode 59 I liked how Amin systematically went through the living costs in London and debunked the idea that you cannot live in London with only one p- that you cannot live in in London with only one person working. His views on the gender roles is something I agree with. My parents worked in a similar manner and it was very important for the kids in their formative years. Unfortunately nowadays a lot of the women only see value in working and not really in wa- raising their children. Even practicing Muslim women want to continue working after their maternity leave and that seems to be a bigger priority. I agree with Muhammad on having a vision slash goal for the marriage. In recent years, I've seen many Muslims who get married, but it really doesn't change their lives one bit. They behave exactly the same before marriage and after marriage. Many also don't seem to prioritize wanting to have kids. Personally, I've been looking for a practicing sister who has a similar vision uh, to have kids and wife, preferably stays at home, um, to mind to marry. But it's really difficult to find someone who has that same mindset. At this juncture, would it be wise to change slash lower my expectations or just to maintain it? Looking forward to your response and many more episodes to come. Jazakallah khairan. Thanks, Hamid. Are you still with us, uh, Muhammad? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Cool. I suppose it's difficult, isn't it? Because it depends on what kind of... What is the greater good for you? you Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is the greater good what you can achieve by being married or is the greater good to be on your own and not go down that road? Like it depends what you want to achieve. It's hard. Yeah, exactly. That's what I think is it depends much on the context. So some people, we, we have to admit as much as every single Muslim should really get married, 99%, there would be a 1%, maybe 2 3 4% who maybe for some reason or another, it's better they don't get married. Um, because it, it, you've got to know yourself. Like maybe if you're... If you know some guys don't have such a, an authoritative way of being, and therefore they might be more influenced, and therefore if they marry a woman who's going to take them a route where they never really wanted to go down, then that might be bad for them. And maybe if they couldn't find someone who's going to take them down a good route, maybe they shouldn't get married, right? Um, and that goes the same for a woman, actually. It's like you know, if you know you get influenced, then marrying someone who's going to take you down the wrong path for the sake of being married, that might be the the worst of the two evils. Yeah, the worst of them. So depends so much on context, isn't it? Like, I suppose the, the good thing is at least he's t- thinking about who to marry as opposed to just yeah having an issue where yeah. you just sort of fall for someone and that's, that becomes it because you're not of having course. A, a long sort of thought process yeah. about it. Mm, to have so more the of fact a, that you're planning, you're doing yeah. some sort of marriage planning, or yeah. you know, I want to marry someone like this and that. That's really good in this day and age. Yeah, I, I think I fail to realize that actually, majority of Muslims these days don't really think like that. Mm. They kind of just, you know, or well, majority of people in general, they're not thinking like, oh, I want to marry this sort of person because in the future I want to achieve this, this, and this. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And uh, you know, let's be real. In the past, I don't think anyone really thought like that either. But maybe that's because it was very much the norm. 
uh, many of these things were the norm. Like, okay, I'm getting married. Of course, we're going to have kids. Of course, we're going to do this. Of course, we're going to yeah. do that. Uh, because of more of a monoculture situation. But I, I lean towards, bro, not lowering expectations. If your expectations are marrying somebody who, you know, makes makes the akhirah quite a priority in their life, um, yeah. wants to have kids, wants to build a family, and is more of a stay-at-home mother kind of situation. If those are like the standards you're you're referring to, I don't think those are like very such high standards that you need to compromise them, right? Mm. And I also understand that if you did compromise on those uh, on those things, and those things are very important and almost deal breakers not to have, then yeah, I would say stick to your standards if those are your standards. Because if I imagine myself. Um, Marrying a woman who's like very much on the career and we, like we agree before we get married, like, yes, uh, she's going to work. I'm going to work and we're going to work out how to do the whole kids thing. Mm. If I ended up in a marriage like that, I'll tell you. or it, Yeah, I, it would not work. Like I'm almost sure it wouldn't work because many factors like A, I just don't believe in it. B, I wasn't raised like that whatsoever. Uh, it's not normal to me at all. So you've mm. got to be real like what your red lines are, isn't it? Mm definitely have to establish them beforehand and and truly establish them not just say oh i'll change mm. for the sake of this marriage like it has to be something yeah. that you've already had in your mind beforehand mm. because mm. you know people change for marriage only for a few months mm -hmm. then, it, the, then <laughs> the, the real yeah. them cuts don't yeah you know, starts to but what about changing like what about changing uh, your expectations or changing your you know your behavior your lifestyle but based based on lesser things than like having kids or I the gender fine. roles I or that's yeah. i think that's fine i think that's gonna have to happen to everyone anyway because yeah nobody gets what they want you know and mm. i think what we mm. want you know yeah. always is gonna 100 percent exist yeah. in the dunya um, yeah but there are gonna have to be these key elements that you really don't you have to mm. establish whatever those are for yourself um, yeah they're gonna have to be these key things that don't mm. budge for you um yeah and you've got to remember like humans are you know you're marrying a human being that's susceptible to change susceptible to trauma susceptible to, to big you know, events uh conditioning them in their life um mm -hmm. so it's not like the thing that you you know the person that you marry is always going to be that way throughout you know you just have to make the right to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that keeps you both steadfast because yeah the, the, you know such as okay let's talk about the brother that you know we spoke about before mm. like i'm sure he made his decision and married someone that was in a particular way and then they can sort of change based on either whether they're internal influences or external influences yeah yeah um you know there's brothers that that this 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 stories you hear of brothers and sisters that are just like in, on some super level bro well not just super level just like an impressive level of of practice and then, then something happens in their life bro and they just absolutely go the complete other way mm. um uh, you know some of the stories i, I could s say are just shocking bro, but mm. these are things happen bro. It's, Allah you're marrying us. a you're marrying a fallible human that can can mm. easily wake mm. up one morning and not even be muslim bro it's just the reality yeah so uh, first and foremost in front of everything is that you have to i always say it about everything but you have to rectify your relationship with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and establish a rapport almost where you're constantly conversing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly asking making dua such a normal thing for yourself so mm. that you you always feel protected you always feel engaged you always feel like everything that happens in your life is is Allah guiding you towards something because you can't feel guided and protected if your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so weak anyway mm. yeah but if you have a strong connection and you're sincere then you could say xyz is happening because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants this for me or wants to test me with this or whatever. And at least that way, you know, well, I'm not going to be punished because I, you know, well, you could be punished, of course, but you're, you're more likely to feel that whatever trial you're going through, whatever path Allah is taking you for is, is a test and is guidance as opposed mm -hmm. to a punishment. <coughs> uh, because if you weren't, and if you aren't connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and these things happen to you, they could easily be a punishment for you. You know, it, mm -hmm. or at least you would feel that they're a punishment for you. And that way you wouldn't know what to do. You'd feel lost. Yeah. yeah. Very good point, bro. Like mm. those two points, this one and the one about like, it's good that you're even thinking in terms of goals for your family and all that. Uh, very good. And uh, I think I need to work on that personally, bro. Like I don't make dua enough. I, I think I like, I end up, 
making certain dua again and again, which are like general dua. But like, what about making dua that if I drive to Dubai, that I make it there safely and I make it back safely? Or oh, like bro. these Honestly, things. I, I don't know if this is just something that people should implement more. But like any time that you're alone, you should just be in a position where you can actually... It's quite difficult for some people. I've just sort of developed it. But where you literally just... It's almost like you're talking to yourself. Mm. But you know you're not. You're talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because when you're constantly conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and conscious of, of Him watching you mm. and everything you do, mm. then everything that happens, you know that He knows what's happening and He's causing it to happen. Mm. Which means that... I feel more peace in my heart knowing that, you know, I could spend, I could, okay, let's say I'm driving to London, okay, this is a hypothetical scenario, driving to London, so that's like an hour and a half journey, and I'm on my own, so in that time, I'm spending a lot of it talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for things, or whatever, right, and when I reach London, something goes wrong, something happens, Yeah. okay, in that moment, because I'm so conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in that moment, I can react to that moment knowing that it's guidance, or it's Allah wants something for me right now, or Allah mm. wants me to do something right now, as opposed to if I didn't have that conversation, or if I was listening to music all the way there, or do you know what I mean, so far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even mentally, let's say I didn't even sin, bro, I wasn't even sinning, but just consciously I wasn't very connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when mm. I get there, I'm automatically going to see that, as some, like, oh, my life's going wrong, or am I, why am I being punished, or why me? kind of thing mm. you start saying why me why me but mm. if you're already conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have that established connection then you feel like well Allah's not going to punish me he's, mm. he's guiding me something's happening right now I need mm. to do something you mm. give this issue a bit of importance that is beyond just the dunya you give it this sort of extra terrestrial importance sort of thing um, so I think that's why it's so important bro I think uh, it's it should be done what it should be done is in the salat and for mm. some reason, it's difficult for a lot of us to... Mm. And sujood and stuff. To, yeah. yeah, and sujood and stuff. It's difficult for a lot of us to even focus in prayer. Um, so mm. if, you're str if you're somebody, you know, you know, I'm somebody myself who struggles a lot to have khushu' in prayer. But if, I, uh, if I'm struggling, at least when I'm not in prayer, I'm still trying to increase that conversation because then I feel mm. like it would, um, it would benefit me in my whole mm. life to have that conversation go yeah. and be conscious you know yeah you reminded me actually maybe I need to reignite this uh, habit I used to try to establish which is putting five minutes aside every day for to make dua and it was like mm. always it was always specifically like after Isha so it's like after Isha I'm not going to be in a hurry to go somewhere and therefore it's like I will feel still enough I, I won't be in a rush and I can make you know, just take time to make dua then. So it's like giving it a time every day when you do it and stuff. So do you, do you find yourself, good. you know, like I'm sure you've gone through difficult times in your life. Do you find that in those difficult times that you're conversing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more? Come on, bro. That's not even a question. Like definitely. That's what I'm trying to say. Definitely. Like, this is it. So like, and I've realized, and this is why I get really frustrated with myself because mm obviously recently I've been going through some really tough times bro and then I'll have a few days where actually things are going well mm. and bro compare how I was when I really needed it mm. to when I don't and it's so annoying and I get so frustrated and then when something wrong happens again I blame myself for, for being distant from a last five times yeah, and I yeah, see that yeah. as a punishment but also like, this is the this is the natural flow of things yeah. and this is why this is one of the wisdoms that uh, of why Allah tests us Mm. isn't it it's it's actually a mercy um you know like literally like coronavirus like uh some people will uh, react in a certain way and some people will react by turning to allah and being humbled in front of allah and realizing wow yeah we really are quite weak and you know allah grant us jannah allah grant us a good death allah grant us this of course. so that's the literally that is the purpose and that is why every situation is good for the believer, I suppose. It's isn't difficult, it? isn't it? Because mm. I remember, like, I, when I was going, like, I was having those anxiety attacks and whatever, and I was thinking, oh, I don't want this whatsoever. But mm. then at the same time, I would say, if I didn't have this, would I be so connected to Allah exactly. in this moment? Honestly, bro, you know? I almost miss those times. Mm. Like, it's hard to say I miss them because it's so difficult at the time. But I honestly, I had a sweetness, like, it's um, it's literally like in the ma'al usri yusra ma yeah ma'al usri yusra together the coming together it's like on one hand I'm like so 
stressed and whatever. On the other hand, I I for that for the certain parts of the day I'm feeling so much peace, so much tawakkul, so like mm. amazing. And so that's why now when I'm sitting here years later, I'm kind of like uh yeah, I kind of miss that. Like like a part of me like does miss that. Mm. It's oh. it's strange, bro, isn't it? Because it's the one it is the one shining light in all of that darkness that you have. But then the moment mm. when your life is all light, you just don't yeah. see it. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Then um, then yeah. You can't appre it's almost like you can't appreciate a candle in, 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 in sunlight, can yes. you? When like when your whole life is, is is fine, then you can't appreciate this little beam of light. But then when your whole life is in darkness, this beam of light becomes your everything. You know? Hundred percent. That's an analogy anyway. Um but yeah, yeah it was, a, it was a good one. Straight we strayed off a little bit, but yeah. that's that's ultimately what I say to anyone who's in a dilemma. In any dilemma, whatever it is, like oh whether I should do this or that, or whether I should do this or that. Because mm. the whole okay, let's say we talk about istikhara, yeah. Istikhara mm. is having that conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then believing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is gonna guide you to what's best for you. Yeah. Okay. But if you're constantly having conversations with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you consciously you become consciously aware of always being guided to what's best for you. Mm. And you wouldn't feel you wouldn't feel like these things are tests or trials in the sense that you're being punished. Yeah. Um, you know? Yeah. Um, it is what it is, bro. Mm. It is. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I personally would compromise on some of these higher level standards. Like, like because you're saying you're finding it hard to find someone who's like what you're looking for. I would compromise on stuff like age, like, oh, does she have to like have memorized the Quran or is her tajweed great or does she seek knowledge or these things I would definitely compromise on because I feel like, you know, like a good wife or a good husband isn't necessarily the most knowledgeable of the Sharia, right? Not necessarily. Um, it's, it's more like somebody who just has good character, same values as you. You know these th these I think really think is what makes a good marriage. You know. Yeah. So as for somebody who's gonna push you to do your hiv and this and that, maybe that's more for friends to do. You know. But uh, yeah, bro, there is a juicy question on Curious Cat. Oh God. That there's like three questions. I guess it's all from the same person. It's all the same topic. Oh, it's about the. Is it about the wife and the thing and the? Oh yeah! Yes! Yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> <laughs> I've been avoiding these ones, bro. God, oh, man. Okay. You know what? I, you know what I out. sometimes do, bro. Go on. Some I actually often. I'm not gonna lie. Often uh, I'll see these um, the questions or the emails coming in, and I might just see it, and I might just tell my wife, "Oh, this question came," and then we'll discuss it. So I kind of do like a rehearsal for right. when we're gonna record. Some questions I do that. <laughs> this is one of them, yeah. <laughs> this is definitely one of them. I'm sure. Well, I mean, there's three of them here, but I'm sure. Anyway, let's just stop the, the anticipation before my son wakes up because of these <laughs> weird noises. Um, okay, this was 26 days ago. Oh my god, is he awake? No, he's not awake. Okay, Assalamu alaikum. What do you advise? What do you advise, sister who struggle with polygamy? Would you yourself ever do it? What would your wife or family say? And then the next one was, Assalamu alaikum. Please help me how to tell my wife I want a second wife would you brothers be too scared like me and the last one was have you mentioned about a new wife to your other wives <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there was another one somewhere that I was asked and I mm. just sort of had to mm. um, oh, actually I think maybe the first one is different from the second two maybe a different person isn't it mm. okay. do you know what I think what's really important is with matters like this you need to think about why you want to do it um, what is it about you that wants that I'm not saying that's wrong no way am I saying that's wrong in any shape way or form um, but it's what what is the reasoning what is your purpose what is the um, and, and I think that's that's a more important discussion to have uh, mm -hmm. because it's not going to be easy no no way especially in this day and age is it going to be easy not necessarily being married to someone but even having that conversation <coughs> with your your missus about you know wanting another wife of course it won't be easy of course mm. it won't be easy so asking us for advice on that as if our advice is going to make it any easier it's just not 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 going to be the case like whatever we say isn't going to change the way your wife reacts that's just not 
not going to happen. If you're so concerned about your wife's reaction to the point that you're asking us, this isn't going to change anything. Like, there's no way that you can rephrase that question unless you can establish why you want it. Do you understand? Yeah, just there's like no way that just like you can approach your wife. Throw in some like glitter dust on the question to no, make it nicer. There, <laughs> there is nothing that you can say or do. In fact, you might make it worse by trying to phrase it in a particular way. Mm. You, know, you know what I mean? Mm. And trying to mm. just beat around the bush with it, mm. like there's, there's mm. something like this. Like, wait, bro. First, you, what was the first question again? The first question was. Uh, sorry, let me scroll. Uh, what would you do to advise the sisters who struggle with polygamy? Would you ever do it? Would you yourself ever do it? And what would your mm. wife or family say? Yeah. So what about that? Like, it sounds like she's already, you know, in a that kind of marriage. No, because I think this is a dude, bro. Because the second question is, someone like, please help me how to mm. tell my wife I want a second wife. But we're and assuming all, all it's the, the same uh, person. I think it is because the grammar is all messed up on every question. <laughs> I'm not okay. being rude, it's just the reality. Like, Okay, got it. I, anyway, I mean, we could answer them separately. We could answer them separately as if it's a woman and a man. I, you might be right. Um, but I don't know, bro. I'll be honest with you. I just don't know because it's such a a foreign entity to me i can't really advise anyone on it mm. all i can say is that <clears throat> people need to establish the reason why they're doing things yeah you know? especially yeah. the men who want to marry someone else they really need to establish why they want to do it and if it's something yeah. that is is it is it serving a bigger purpose or is it serving something that's just so you know self-serving and if it is self-serving then you need to be honest with yourself i'm not saying that just because it's self-serving means that you don't do it I'm mm. saying that you just need to be honest with yourself. <laughs> yeah. That's all it is. Very good. You know? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think the way I think of this topic is like, um, personally, it is like, it's not something that is, that is like common in my culture, my upbringing, whatever, yeah? Mm. I don't think, yeah, I don't have any family members who have like more than one wife or anything like that. Um, and I think that's the case for many people, many Muslims. Um you know, there are certain areas in the world where it's common, like in uh, West Africa, like maybe certain parts of the Gulf. But for most Muslim societies, you could you could say, unfortunately, it's not common. It's not normal. It's not seen as normal. Um, as for me, I just because of that reason, it's, it's quite uh, uh, not normal for me. Uh, I'm not really it's not something I'm really like I ever considered seriously. Um and I'm not really, don't have it in my plans at all, right? Um, but, you know, even if I wanted to, let's say I wanted to, um, for my own preference, let's just say, you know, um, yeah. I, I'm a risk-averse guy, right? Which means that if I think that that, that second wife, that second marriage or whatever would uh, perhaps drag the first marriage down to like zero and ruin it, like I think there's like a pretty good chance that it would ruin it, right? And so therefore, it's like not worth the risk. Like it's just too big a risk. And that's even if I wanted to. But you know, the way like the last year or two, I've started to think of uh, polygyny. It's like it's less about the man's preferences and the man's wants. I see it more as a mechanism to actually to support women. Oh, that's how I see it now. Like, I've, that yeah. I, I, I've I had that shift in perspective as well, mm. and, and and I think that's why I, I I always try and talk to people that talk like this about their intention and and what, who they're doing it for. Yeah. Because there's been brothers that have have discussed publicly about you know they they have you know more than one wife and stuff, mm. and they talk about it as this greater sort of community benefit as opposed to mm. um, themselves. I remember even recently there was someone who came onto the Dean Show and spoke about it. Okay. And he had his two wives with him, and um, I saw a snippet of it, uh, and it he was basically like a community leader almost, mm -hmm. um, and and his wives were really supportive, and they the way they spoke about it, even in that short clip, I think that whole thing is an hour long, mm. and and maybe it's worth someone watching that if that's something they're interested in. Okay. But, um, yeah, the way they spoke about it really kind of putting the man's desires to the side, putting the woman's desires to the side. Let's speak about mm. community right now, mm. because even when I talk back at my family, bro, because it's quite it's quite an old practice in my 
from my ancestors but like the p- last person i've heard that did it was like my great grandfather or my great grandfather mm. or something like that and the story i heard was that it's literally because of community need mm. it was because his wife was struggling and she's the one who came to him and said listen i'm wanting to marry someone else because i need some help because this is too much for me or something along those right lines, you yeah know I mean? yeah so, so it, w- it was it was at that level of discussion back mm-hmm. then. it's kind of down the same route as why people used to have many kids um, mm. It's like to help around the the farm or whatever. That was at least mm. one of the reasons. Um, but I think now the reason for doing it, but maybe it's uh, I don't know if it's hypocritical of me or not that I wouldn't really consider it. But yet I I do think it needs to be reintroduced, um, and I do think there might be another need for it now. So in the past there might have been a need for certain kind of support. Now it might be more the need, the need of uh, it's, there seem to be quite a few. Um, sisters maybe some of them a little bit older sisters who are not married and maybe it looks like they're never going to get married and so they like people need to be in families like it's not good in a society for people to be single that actually causes a lot of problems for men i mean maybe men being single is much worse than women being single but they each create their own big challenges in society right i mean you know get a get a get a random gang yeah like they go around robbing people none of them will be married you know mm. there's a reason for that when a man gets married he he gets he he changes his world view should change at least yeah and so yeah. i think i think it's a, it's an important mechanism for for that scenario that i mentioned like there are certain women who it looks like they're not really going to get married and they need to be part of a family and so i i think it should be encouraged in that sense uh, as for me i, I I don't know. I I just uh, it's not something normal for me. It's something that would, uh, and basically, for most of us, it's going to be something that it is. It might take a toll on your first wife, and it might mess up your family dynamics. And like I said, I'm risk averse. So, for that reason, like, uh, maybe most of us wouldn't go down that route. But if you, you know, if it would work for you, there wouldn't be that kind of potential downside. Then. You know, I think that's a good idea. But when it comes to, let's say you're in a society where it's not normal, your wife would be very resistant to it. And and you, plus the fact, the reason you want to do it is just for your own kind of preference. I would say perhaps put that preference to the side. Like just just give that up for this life. And in the akhirah, you know, you can do what you like kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. That That's what I maybe I would suggest. Yeah, it's something that needs to... A lot of the time, it's something that needs to be supported by society in general. Exactly. In the like you can't, you can't imagine society. that in the past. You can't imagine in the past that average woman would actually be over the moon for this to happen, right? Mm. But when something is very normal in a society, people tend to let things go easier. That even if they don't like it, right? Mm. Like for example, I give you a good example. I was just thinking of this. Um, elders how are we supposed to treat elders in the community you know we're supposed to like give them every excuse we're supposed to put up with some annoying behavior that you know that that old people just tend to have sometimes Um, we're supposed to just you know deal with it right Um, just you know agree with them and just kind of you know move along kind of thing Um, if if that wasn't if it wasn't bad in our culture to stand up to them to rebel against them to you know fix them if you quote unquote fix them mm. change their their behavior their rudeness whatever if it wasn't in our culture to do that then we would stick it to them and we would do that but we don't do it because it's looked down upon mm. and so it's like cult- uh, cultural pressures and these things really play a big role here and and so yeah i, I think i said what i said i think i said what i didn't said in the rehearsal man mm. <laughs> But, but yeah, you said the rehearsal. <laughs> you said it because otherwise you get you get in trouble if you say something else. <laughs> no, the, honestly, the, I'm not filtering myself. It's my genuine like. If the, basically, I personally, for my preference, I'm not really interested. Yeah? yeah, but I can see the benefit, the wider community benefit, and that's the only thing that would make me consider it. But even then, yeah. uh, even then, if your family was your existing family was ever to kind of. T- take a downturn or like get messed up because of it then it's just not smart because yeah that's the thing when, yeah. when when society itself isn't like that then that you run the risk of your children your your the, your not just yourself but like your children your extended family whatever all of their opinions of you change mm. because it's so 
it's a bit of like an osmosis thing where like the concentration is that there's people that don't do that that's the norm yeah and yeah. it's easier to be affected by it's a very easy thing to be affected by the negative um connotations of that mm. however if someone wants to be a martyr <laughs> and wants to do <laughs> take that, one for the community take one for the team and take one for the community <laughs> then more power to them as long as they 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 feel like that's something that they because it's, it's something that they have to establish and be good at doing yeah so that they can then use that as dower for the rest of the, the world mm. if you're going to do it for in this day and age if you're going to do it purely to satisfy carnal desires and you're not going to use it as a a um what's the word like a catalyst to promote a uh, positive you know positive effects of it and the positive community benefits of it etc mm. then actually you're probably gonna have a hard mm. time you know you're yeah gonna have a hard time mm. but if you're if you're quite vocal and you want to be the best man you can be because it, it will take twice the man to do so yeah um then fair enough that's why i just so, don't see it as something that is going to serve a man very well because it's like double the expenses double the time double the this double the that Obviously, it's a good thing to do, and you're gonna you're gonna be giving double, Yanni, double the reward, inshallah, as well, and all of that. But it's just like a lot of the average guy is not down for the level of work um, or effort or whatever required for this. Uh, just with many things, like is the average man ready to become a scholar? Is he is the average man ready to memorize the book of Allah? Like these things take a lot of effort, so you got to be real about the level of effort you can you, you you've got to put into something, isn't it? Mm, definitely, definitely. Um, and uh, yeah, I just I can't I see, bro. This person asking the question is very serious, yeah. or it's, it's mm. quite a difficult one to gauge. But it's a good it's a good discussion. Ultimately, um, ultimately, mm. I think it's a good discussion. Uh, but like, I honestly think it's it's bad for society that it's not like normal anymore. I, mean, I genuinely I mean, bro, think. Listen, that. A lot of bro a lot of people that you know, I'm not gonna name any names whatsoever, but there's a lot of people in the Dawah scene mm. that have more than one wife and nobody knows about it. You know, and I've only found out because I speak to them directly. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I've sat with people that are very popular on, on you know, I'm not talking about like the the students, I'm talking about the the, the you know, the, the, the big dogs. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> the more sort of you know, I don't know, the established adults as opposed to you know the people that are maybe at my age and my mm. peers sort of thing you know mm -hmm. but yeah and and even them i'm like oh okay didn't mm. know wouldn't know because they don't talk about it um mm. and you think that they would be the people that talk about it more because they're in a position where they can because they mm. do dawah anyway mm. but even they believe that not believe but even they struggle to be open about it because they're scared of or or worry about the repercussions or what it will do for the dawah or whatever it mm. takes someone to make that their sole goal and their sole dawah in this day and age if they want the shift to, to really mm. happen yeah um, unless you want to like go and live in like senegal or somewhere where it's yeah. very normal <laughs> but a lot of people though mm. a lot of people and a lot of days will say well it's none of their business what i do and that's fine as well yeah if you think about it it is no one's business Mm. If they're doing something that is permitted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whether they, you know as long as they do it that's in a permissible manner and in an encouraged manner then it actually is no one's business so they have no need to tell anyone about what they do and how they live their life mm. yeah you yeah know? yeah actually I it's just not, thought of it's it's I was just going to finish mm. off by saying it's not a fundamental part of the religion that needs to be done it's not like part of the five pillars uh, or a neglected mm. uh, encouraged sunnah in the sense that if we don't do it, we're missing out on all this benefit and all of this. Mm -hmm. It's not something that is, you can explicitly say, you know, hypothetically speaking, oh, if you were married to marry someone else, then you would get X, Y, Z in Jannah, or this is the reward for doing so, or whatever. Like, mm. that doesn't necessarily exist in discourse. Mm. So, you know, if, I'm sure if it did, then people would talk about it more. But because it doesn't, then then it's kind of up to your, your own personal preference kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and... Um it, you could say it's a bit of a it's not a duty for people to like get into polygynous marriages but it's a duty to kind of try to get the average single person in your community into a marriage yeah. yes and if one of the mechanisms to do that is through this then that's good that's fine uh, but yeah it's in in and of itself it's not obviously something like that has to be done or whatever um I was going to say, you know, it reminds me of the, I think it was the last episode where we talked about community and the need for community and all of that. And um, this kind of plays well into that as well. It's like, um, 
instead of uh, you living near other families and this, you can actually have kind of two households, if you like, which make up that mini community, if you like. So it, it gives support to each other. You know, the wives can support each other. The children play with each other. You know, this kind of thing happens. So that's very positive. Um, but ultimately, this is only going to happen if the two wives are kind of cool with it. And so you just got to think of the greater good. So is uh, by by marrying a second or third time, or whatever, um, is that going to be better for your akhira, for your wife's akhira, for your general family, uh, and for the for the new wife? You know, is it is it overall going to make sense? Does it make sense that that would work out well? Um, mm. Or is it more likely it's not going to work out well? In which case, you kind of want to protect what you've got, I think, uh, because functional good families seem to be rare. You know, from what I see, at least, they seem to be rare. So we need to really protect them as much as possible. Um, some families would be improved by you know a man marrying a second wife, but some families would, would be damaged. So you got to really just consider all these points. Did we answer everything in those three things? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Um, mm. Yeah, because the last one doesn't actually count. How you mentioned about a new wife to your other wife? Like, why would I? Like, if I'm not. not yeah, we're not really looking to do that, to be honest. <laughs> well, I'm not. Actually, <laughs> we kind of just left it vague. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what else have we got? Um, oh, someone's asking about pure XI. Does it still exist? Um, and the website doesn't work. Yeah, I had to shut Pure XI down a while ago, um, despite the fact I brought it back for a bit. And, you know, people got what they wanted. People that were asking for stuff for ages got what they wanted. But bro, it's just so difficult to do anything. Mm. <laughs> it's so hard, mm. especially with Pure XI, where I'm essentially running everything on my own um, to the point where it's like, how do you even take photos of stuff when you're the one wearing it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, know? yeah, bro. Yeah, it's hard, bro. <laughs> yeah, it's hard, but yeah. um, yeah, it's just it's just not the right time for yeah. me at the moment. And bro, do you feel like? What I understand is that you you go to work and then you you do your family stuff, yeah. But you also yeah. you have the podcast. Do you feel like the yeah. podcast is something, Annie, yani, adding a lot of satisfaction, meaning fulfillment to your life that you're like doing something, or is it like purely like a hobby? depends like it's a bit of both because if we have like a really good discussion on something then i feel like you know that episode was really good and that will benefit people mm -hmm. um it's the one thing that i've probably been the most consistent with i know like i haven't always been 100 percent like on time or consistent or whatever mm. but we've been doing it since like mm. like oh my god yeah we've been doing it for ages really we've been doing it even when i was in, in a completely different organization job wise and stuff um and I, and I I remember when we first thought about it. Um, so for me, it's like, oh, the one co sort of long-term consistent thing I've been doing for ages. Mm. Whether there's any growth in that or whatever, I don't really know. And I'm not too fussed. Mm. It's just about doing it. Mm -hmm. me. That's all I want. Mm. Um, and we have spoken recently about, you know, maybe bringing uh, volunteers on board or whatever, whoever wants to sort of help Mind Heist grow, um, you know, maybe on social media or, or exposure or whatever it is. Because it's only recently, I'll be honest with you, that I've started noticing that actually we've got really loyal listeners. <laughs> Do you know mm. what I mean? Um, yeah, mainly totally. because of the way they, the, the engagement that we've been having on on on, uh, on WhatsApp, on you know these these emails and questions and stuff, and also when people share some episodes on their social media and tag us in it, I realise that they're actually people that listen to every episode and they. Do you know what I mean? Oh, mm. this, they'll promote the mind heist to other people, mm. which is very. Well, I don't really think too much about the the audience as I do just talk, talking to you, mm -hmm. because me and you don't talk too much, and we only really talk on on mind heist, which is like, oh yeah, I'm going to speak to Amin about such and such, or we're going to have this conversation, and then I put the conversation out there, mm -hmm. as opposed to realizing that actually we have pockets of people that are actually. You know, I haven't gone on the stats for ages, so I don't really know. But I still see the rankings and stuff. And like, I remember once we were like fifth. Yeah, we I, were. We got one recently, didn't we? Yeah. I got one email today that talks about rankings. Where is it? Hmm. Here we go. Uh, so at the moment, we've gone up 
we're up the 17th uh, on, on podcast on, on Muslim podcasts in the UK we're at number 17 mm. um, and it's, it changes every week it goes really high and then really low yeah. every week I guess um, uh, because we didn't I don't really know how it works week. personally mm. it goes a bit funny but like if you look at the history of rankings like we've been really high on some occasions mm. um, here we go rank history just try and load it up so that I can uh, justify my point here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I remember one week we were fifth um, yeah, in yeah, UK yeah. Islam. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, once apparently once in 2019 we were the third, mm. third highest. That must be the 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 highest we've ever been. Mm. I don't really know how it works. Yeah, me neither. It says it here. Yeah, peak position number three. Mm. If we were to just go religion spirituality, peak position number eight. If mm. we were to go, can we do America? How does United States of America? I don't really know if we get. So peak position in of Islam in America was thirty two. Mm. Well, obviously, America's got a lot more. Um, this is really cool. I never thought about this. What other countries are there that are quite uh, engaged? I know we get like eighty percent of the downloads from the UK. Um, yeah, it'd probably just be most of the UK. UK, yeah. US. Um, I, then we then it's very spread out. I think we get like Scandinavia, Canada, Australia, yeah, UAE. Was, I think yeah. So UAE, yeah, yeah, we were eleventh in the UAE. Hmm. Yeah. But Alhamdulillah, yeah, bro. I always bro. feel like I always feel like because for a long time I put a lot of my kind of effort and focus on business and my business and being like I need to build this business and then I'll focus on my more like contributions. But um, I think I, my, my satisfaction I get from my business goes up and down a lot. Yeah, because business goes yeah. up and down a lot. Um, but as for Mind Heist, it's like every week, if I put an episode out every week, I always feel like I've done something for, for the yeah. contribution side of my life, you know. Yeah. So, and inshallah, it, think, it does contribute, you know. Like. It, it, for me, the only, the only challenge I've got with Mind Heist at the moment um, which is a shame, really. It's just because I feel like I've kind of hit a bit of a... Even though we're not doing anything extravagant, I kind of hit like this bar now where I don't know if I can go any higher in terms of doing more for it. You know, because like mm -hmm. with any podcast, especially the ones that have come out recently, it's like, you know, they're doing video content, interviews, bringing people on, uh, maybe video production, even like, you know, yeah. a good friend Faisal, he's doing events and stuff. And, you know, mm -hmm. I... In, in an ideal world I could see Mind Heist going to that position but right now I don't think I could even do that myself like I couldn't fuel that I wouldn't know how yeah. to which is why I would like I, I am open to the idea of, of you know anyone that wants to be part of Mind Heist in not necessarily on the actual podcast like you know uh, not saying we're going to bring someone new on but in terms of doing anything around it uh, you know whether that's mm. managing social media or creating content for it or whatever Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh God, hello. <laughs> I think that might be my cue. Oh my God, he's jumping on the baby. Get off! <laughs> oh man. Um. So yeah. <laughs> anyway, I mean, I think I'm gonna have to disappear now because uh, there's no Perfect way I can timing. continue. <laughs> now he gave us a good a good time window. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Hello. Do you want to okay. say something? Go on. Say something. Hello. Say hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Are you whispering? <laughs> <laughs> All right then. Yalla, I'm gonna have to end it here. Oh, bro. Clear. Yalla, okay, bro. Okay, Subhanakallah Mobi Hamdika Shadow and Laila La Enter a stuff for a two boy lake. Go to mindheistpodcast dot com to send us your questions. Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam.